Hello Indie Game Fan, today I want to talk about Stacklands, but first, some info. Stacklands is brought to us by the Sockpop Collective, the self-described boy band of indie game development, a descriptor that's a little bit cringy and they themselves seem to be not using that anymore, comprising of these four fellows based out of the Netherlands. They have one of the most interesting business models in that they are primarily Patreon funded, beginning in 2018 with the current monthly pledges up to US$8,965, which split four ways comes up to about $2,000 per person after fees, which is pretty good. For $3 a month, you get one new game per month and one from their backlog, which provides a steady source of income for these guys to keep making awesome games. Their titles, while smaller experiences, are quirky, weird, and fun, and while the quality may be hit or miss, it's nice to have something new to look forward to every month. Stacklands in particular was from developer Aran Koenig, where he revealed how they are able to put out that many games, in that the developers actually work on their games solo, each having 4 months to make their title, but the collective structure allows them to release at a steady clip. Aran did an interview with the Game Discover Co. newsletter in July, so this data is a little outdated, but you can see the numbers yourself, 476,000 units sold, and a total net revenue of $1.4 million. I think that you have to deduct Steam's 30% cut from this number, so that leaves us with 1,025,862.60, which brings us to the million dollar question, why did this game blow up? Technically, Stacklands is a fine game, nothing mind-blowing visually, but the adorable art certainly helps with the vibes, despite it not really being a cosy game. One thing that I realised was very well designed is the gameplay loop, since you always need to ensure that your villagers have enough food while having to advance further up the tech tree, equip your villagers with weapons, construct buildings, generate stuff to sell, so that you can get your next booster pack of cards. This booster pack element is certainly borrowed from physical trading card games or more recently, loot boxes, but without microtransactions while retaining the fun and surprise of opening one of these. In essence, all games are designed to give you that dopamine hit, but the blind box design is excellent at that, so you can borrow that from free-to-play games without going down the predatory monetization route. It is intuitively designed in that crafting game fashion where combining rocks with sticks gives you tools, and the beauty of this game lies in the timers. There's always something going on, so you have to frantically try to maximize your productivity, so while it is a card game, the real-time element does add action to the game, although the option to pause and think is there as well. On to the intangibles. Making a good game these days is not enough to guarantee success, where there are quite a number of things working in their favour. Firstly, they got the reps in, and as noted in my 100k subscriber special, I have a strong belief in the effectiveness of hard work, of getting better the more you do something, so with Suckpop having made about 100 games over 4 years, that's 25 games per person or 6 games per year, and as long as you keep making and learning and improving, eventually you will get to a game or product or video that will take off. In his video, Aran noted that he had the idea and prototyped it for a while but did wait for a few months, thinking about and experimenting with the concept before going back to fully making the game, so taking the time to think and plan is important as well. He also mentioned the importance of getting started and talks about the perfection trap of getting in your own head and wanting to make the perfect game, but basically just start making a game and you will see the tweaks needed as you go along. Another important aspect is getting help which in this case was the art. He contacted an industry friend to do this, to get help in the areas that you're weak in, whether it's marketing, music or design. Localization and translation work in the modern era is especially important since your game may just find an audience in another country. In this case, that was the Chinese market, with China accounting for 32% of total copies sold, more than the 24% of the US, and 5% in France and Germany respectively. I've heard of games blowing up in Brazil or Spain or Korea, which you would never expect, where these markets are completely different to the English language market, with entirely different YouTubers and streamers as well, so definitely look into this. 
Post-launch, the work was just beginning since there were bugs to fix, so he went to work, releasing patch after patch after patch, until the issues were resolved. So be prepared for such problems to crop up, especially if the game has not been extensively playtested, and create ample space in your calendar to attend to these. The success of this game also enabled him to make more content for it, releasing the free island update with 100 plus new cards, 30 new quests, and 30 new blueprints or ideas having a knock-on effect on the sales of the game. I also want to touch upon the support structure that he has, given that Sockpop is set up as a collective, the million dollar profit is split four ways, where the outsized successes like this covers the stress of the development cycle and it seems like they're having a great time. I know, collectives are not for everyone, but if you have a network of game developer friends, ideas can be bounced off each other and the support network is there since the road of an indie game developer can be rather lonely. Let me know if you like this format in the comments, support me on Patreon and watch this video for more of the best indies of 2022. Bye.